Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Hello, folks. Sarah Simon here. I'm a class of 72 civil engineer, and I coordinate the uh, MIT Energy, Environment, and Sustainability Network. And we invited Professor Wood to be our speaker this month, and we're doing this in conjunction with the MIT Alumni Association Faculty Forum, which is where a lot of our publicity has come from. And, and Danielle Wood is our, as an alum, so we are delighted to have her with us. Um, we, we like to feature alums working in, in the areas of energy, environment, and sustainability. I'm going to be the moderator this, this today. Uh, and just a, a, one more word of background. The EESN is a worldwide community of MIT alumni, alumni who are collaborating to solve our complex environmental and energy challenges. We want a sustainable future for our kids and our grandkids. The network is 10 years old this year. We came together after a survey of alumni interest, and we have more than 36 alumni on our um, mailing list. And for this event, we are delighted to see attendees from many other groups. We present this uh, Designing for Sustainability on Earth and Space, and I've probably got the title a little mixed up there, uh, because we, we like to feature all the work that's being done by alums in three main areas, creating business and tech solutions for a clean and thriving future economy. This includes things like renewable energy, clean transportation, and efficiency measures. We like to feature alums who are taking action at all levels to make progress in policy and planning, and we also uh, like to feature alums who are studying how to preserve and restore land, water, and other environmental resources. So we invite you to join our mailing list. Uh, and I think I said this already, but there's about 3,600 of us who are signed up there. And we hope, hope that we will be able to grow that list because there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of good alums out there ready to collaborate and take action. This particular Zoom event is a webinar. So chat will not be available to the attendees, um, but you will be able to see notes that our panelists and our moderator uh, post there. We will be monitoring and taking questions and answers. So please use that. Um, we, will answer, we will answer as many questions as we can. That'll be about, uh, about 35, 30 to 40 minutes after we start because Professor Wood will start with a presentation for us. Um, and um, we will have also in that uh, the chat that goes to you from us, uh, there will be some relevant URLs and information. So with that introduction, uh, Ramon Bueno is going to introduce us a little further to Professor Wood. Greetings. Um, I'm uh, also a uh, coincidentally an Aero and Astro uh, original graduate. So it's a, it's a pleasure for me to uh, introduce the topic and, and our speaker. Um, when I came to MIT and chose the Aero and Astro Department, which is Core 16, the field at that time was so um, way out there, futuristics. Humans uh, would uh, be steadily improving air travel. The, uh, the Concorde, for those who remember it, was starting its uh, two-hour transatlantic flights. Uh, Apollo, the Apollo program, humans were orbiting the Earth, traveling to the moon and back um, with you know, sophisticated uh, software and computers uh, for controlling guidance. Um, the International Space Station uh, with transportation via the space shuttle was, was in the works. Um, we would uh, be able to live and working in the, in the earth beyond the, the atmosphere. Um, and uh, I mentioned earlier uh, in, in our informal chat here, uh, yesterday the New York Times science section had a special multi-page feature on the International Space Station commenting on 20 years of uh, continuous uh, uh, habitation there. Um, then, you know, spacecraft uh, beyond would be visiting Mars and, and to the outer edge of the solar system. We've had Martian rovers uh, roaming the planet and sending data back for years now. Uh, so very exciting. But then um, NASA and rocket science sort of faded a bit as, as resources uh, and, and government support uh, faded, got smaller. Um, but meanwhile, back here on the planet, back on Earth, um, Global poverty and uh, unjust socioeconomic and racial inequality it just continued competing for attention and resources. And now, in, in this situation, um, no longer a future just being imagined, the warming earth uh, producing increasing devastating hurricanes, extreme weather, 
sea level rise, extreme droughts, heat waves, uh, conditions right for uh, vast fires, famine, and, and so on, uh, food uh, disruption. So, so these pressing climate challenges call for quickly moving to low and then zero carbon emission technologies. For example, in, in, in this field, uh, power for uh, no carbon aviation is a, is a big, huge challenge. And we have space ventures that are exploring minerals, resources in asteroids, while satellites that are no longer functioning are littering in orbit, uh, nearly forgotten, out of view, uh, you know, uh, accumulating waste a few hundred miles above, the, uh, above our, our heads. But today, we're going to hear something a much broader uh, human grounded mission of using space technology and systems to help solve the broader challenges of a better future for uh, on Earth and in space. Professor Wood and her group are guided in part by international efforts of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which are to improve the life of millions around the world. Uh, she says we can design systems to apply capabilities on Earth data that are unleashed by space technology to build a more just and sustainable society here at home in the planet. So we're pleased to have with us uh, Danielle Wood, Professor Danielle Wood from the classes of 08, I mean 04, 08, and 12, repeat uh, there. Uh, she's a founding director of the Space Enable Research Group at the MIT uh, Media Lab, uh, and she's going to share uh, work from the, the group. Um, Professor Wood holds also a joint appointment with the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics, where she uh, received an undergraduate degree. And she is a scholar in societal development uh, with a background that includes satellite design, earth science applications, systems engineering, technology policy, many things. She's held positions at NASA headquarters, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, Aerospace Corporation, John Hopkins University, and the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs. So we have a, 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 a qualified speaker here. Please welcome Danielle, and uh, we're glad to have you here with us. Thank you so much. My great thanks to the overall team that's organized, and I appreciate all the collaboration among the faculty and alumni that are participating in making these events possible. It's my privilege to be part of this long-term series of the Faculty Forum, serving the alumni community, and an honor to speak to you today. My name is Danielle Wood, and as you heard, I direct the Space Enabled Research Group at the MIT Media Lab, where our mission is that we seek to advance justice in Earth's complex systems using designs enabled by space. And I so appreciate Ramon's comments on this trajectory of the story, asking not just what interesting things humans can do in space, but asking what hard decisions do we need to make now and in the coming years to work towards sustainability wherever humans are operating. And what I try to encourage my students and my colleagues to consider is that we as humans have made a lot of decisions already that have created challenges for sustainability. And if we look at them as an integrated system, we'll see patterns that are similar in our activities in the ocean, on the land, in the atmosphere, and in orbit around the Earth, and wherever humans plan to go beyond orbit of the Earth, perhaps on the moon or asteroids or Mars, we consistently have been creating waste. And we like to put, whether it's carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas waste, or plastic objects in the ocean, or chemical pollution, we often don't clean up our waste. And we consider it part of our normal economic activity to have this kind of waste, either products or sometimes energy, uh, going as heat right into the atmosphere. But we must do better. And I hope that by talking across those who care about these issues of sustainability and climate change, comparing notes about sustainability in the ocean environment, on land, in the atmosphere, in orbit around the earth and perhaps beyond, we can actually find better ideas for addressing sustainability by looking at this as a systemic challenge that wherever humans are operating, we must both have environmental, social and economic sustainability. So with that, I'd like to share with you a few examples of the work of the Space Enabled Research Group. And I hope you enjoy some examples and opportunities to see concrete projects that are prototyping ways we can operate with sustainability on Earth and in space. Of course, as a small research team, we're not expecting to solve problems on our own. Our goal is often to collaborate with leaders at the government level, at national, international, and also municipal governments, and also with entrepreneurs and researchers in different countries around the world and here in the US. We're often asking, how can our ideas contribute to their existing efforts as they work towards sustainability in local and international ways. I always like to start by giving credit to my team and you'll have a chance to hear from some of the voices. These are the graduate students and research staff 
that are part of Space Enabled right now. And I'm so proud to have them as part of the team contributing to our work. And of course, they're coming from a variety of backgrounds and I'll highlight some of those in a few moments. As I mentioned, our mission statement is that we seek to advance justice in Earth's complex systems using designs enabled by space. One of the key features of this mission statement should be the question of what do we mean by justice? In order to explore this question, I teach a class each fall. I actually invert the phrase. Instead of saying we're going to advance justice, I ask, can space enabled designs advance justice and development? And we look at a lot of writings from social scientists, especially historians, identifying forms of injustice that have been dominant, especially in the last 500 years, identifying the way that uh, racial uh, prejudice and also discrimination and patterns that have kept people in different classes in very rigid ways have caused injustice, but also been part of the challenge of creating environmental degradation. We ask the question, how can we use this understanding of past injustice and, and ongoing injustice to inform our technical designs as we create complex socio-technical systems that combine technology, software, organizational design, and policy. And when we think about that in a very holistic way, using systems thinking, which I'll highlight later in the talk as well. Our message is that there are existing technologies from space that actually have great potential to contribute to sustainability, both on Earth and in space, but we must design them in a way that's very conscious and focused on sustainability as a vision. So part of what we ask is how can satellite Earth observation, satellite positioning and navigation, satellite communication, human spaceflight and microgravity research, space technology transfer, and the research infrastructure of basic fundamental science, how can all of these activities linked to space contribute to sustainable development? Put another way, we also ask how we can use a variety of different research methods and the people in my team encompass these various backgrounds. We use these tools because the challenges we're trying to address are not neatly contained within one way of thinking. But we need to draw from design thinking and art we read a lot from social science and produce research that's contributing to social science theory. And on the technical side, we draw from geospatial analysis and artificial intelligence, satellite engineering, and complex system modeling in a variety of our research projects. There are three major themes I want to highlight today to give you a sense of the categories of research we're doing right now that we hope contribute from different perspectives to the concept of sustainability. And again, we hope to prototype examples to give us a vision for what can be done at a larger scale. The first are examples of systems that design technology for space that's both accessible and sustainable. And sustainable here particularly speaks to the idea of reducing space debris to ensure we can continue to use space and orbit around the earth for years to come. The second topic is designing space technology to support sustainable development on Earth. And the third is that we explore the links between technology and justice. Over the next few minutes, I'll give you a flavor of some of the projects we're doing in these three themes with some help from my colleagues. And I'll hope to whet your appetite to hear more and give you some references where you can read papers and get some additional detail. The first topic then is designing systems to make space both accessible and sustainable. And within this broader topic, we have both technology development on the hardware side, as well as the development of policies and analytical frameworks that we hope will improve behavior and norms of activity to reduce space debris. I wanna give credit particularly to Dr. Javier Stober, a research engineer in the team who leads a technology development project focused on the use of wax, both candle wax and also beeswax. We've been exploring the potential to use these as a possible fuel for satellites. Part of the idea is to ask if we are able to use a low cost, non-toxic fuel that could be produced uh, as a module, could it be used by more operators of smaller, simpler satellites that are at relatively low altitudes? And could they use them, not necessarily in a very robust way to guide them throughout their mission, but just at the end of the mission to help reduce the space debris when they're finished with their operations? Now I want to play a short video and I'll show you an example of some of the progress we're doing to do laboratory testing on different forms of wax and also related materials. We're seeking to understand what happens when you operate with wax in the microgravity environment. We're curious to see if our theory is correct that actually in microgravity, it'll be easier to form wax into just the right shape in order to have the outcome we want, which is to have a shape, which is a cylinder with the hole in the middle. This phrase of centrifugal casting is the manufacturing process we try to do with wax or other ingredients to create this unique shape. It's just right for combustion. So I'm going to skip ahead to a video a clip 
and ask our colleague Alana Sanchez to give you some additional information. Viscosity. So using water and oil in our preliminary experiments is useful. Now I'll actually pass it over to Alana to discuss centrifugal casting. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. So our centrifugal casting process consists of melting the wax, accounting for the shrinkage fraction as the wax solidifies, and putting it in a casting chamber with a small DC motor. Shown here is a simple schematic of our lab setup. This video is an example of the centrifugal casting process in a laboratory environment. When the motor is initially increasing in rotation rate, the wax forms air pockets, as you can see, uh, before eventually forming a complete standal annulus. And you'll be able to see it when it comes up. Shown right there, you can see how it progresses down the side. Using a side viewing angle, I created a Python script which automates the image analysis and yields solidification distance and rate for each time step. This method will eventually be extended to future microgravity flight projects. And you can see the solidification tracing down the outside of the casting chamber. The multiple and experimental environments shown here facilitate testing under different thermal and gravitational conditions in order to disentangle or quantify the contributions of convective and radiative heat transfer to the solidification process. We have already flown two parabolic aircraft flights, which have leveraged water and motor oil, respectively, in order to simulate the viscosity of wax at various temperatures. Two further flights are upcoming, which will leverage paraffin and beeswax as the working fluid. Two suborbital space flights on board Blue Origin New Shepard are scheduled, which will allow us to, te to run tests at longer time scales, three minutes versus 20 seconds of continuous microgravity. Also upcoming is an experiment on the destiny module of the ISS and a passive experiment on board a Chilean satellite, PlantSat, to measure the ability of paraffin to passively change phase in a reliable way. Here's an image from our last microgravity flight. You can see the entire experimental setup housed in the frame that they are working on. Thanks so much to Alana, Javier, and our team. And our goal there is to just give you a flavor of the work that we're doing and to highlight the way that we're leveraging different kinds of experimental environments, as you saw inside planes, like this picture of Juliet, and we have future flights planned where humans unfortunately can't fly along, but we'll have a even longer exposure to microgravity to find out the behavior of this liquid wax uh, inside an, a rocket environment, which gives about five minutes of microgravity and later on the International Space Station where we can have sustained access to the microgravity environment for weeks on end. That'll be very exciting. And ultimately our goal is to be able to demonstrate after several additional experimental tests, the ability to have wax on board a satellite have it spin during orbit and create just the right geometry for burning and then eventually demonstrate a burn that hopefully would deorbit the satellite. So that's a long-term vision that we hope will help demonstrate the capability of using wax for satellite fuel. And this again will be something that's non-toxic because current satellite fuels can both be expensive but also some of them are carcinogenic and are not safe for humans to handle. Another category of our work to produce space sustainability is the topic of encouraging behavior that's responsible by those operating satellites. You may see news uh, talking about the exciting plans for a number of companies to add large constellations of satellites. Some have already started and they're offering internet services and other communication systems. However, one of our key questions is how many of these constellations can we operate at particular altitudes or locations in space and still have safe avoidance of satellite collisions and the ability to operate safely and have these satellites eventually come out of orbit and be burned in the atmosphere safely. Our team is working as part of an international consortium to create a set of rules and guidelines that we ask people to voluntarily abide by. And then we give them a score or a credit, uh, highlighting those who perform very well. And my colleague Ninu was going to discuss this a bit further. Hello, 
My name is Dr. Meenu Ratnas Bapthi, and I'm pleased to give my virtual presentation at this year's IAC Cyberspace Edition on behalf of my co-authors representing the international and transdisciplinary consortia who are designing and developing the Space Sustainability Rating, or SSR. And this includes the World Economic Forum, the Space Enabled Research Group at MIT's Media Lab, the European Space Agency, the University of Texas at Austin, and Bryce Space and Technology. This paper provides an in-depth description on the methodology used to design the SSR based on successful rating systems in other industries, such as LEED, the Green Building Energy and Environmental Design. With the increasing awareness of the rapidly growing number of objects in space, the implementation of a rating system such as the SSR provides an innovative way to address the orbital challenge by incentivizing industry at different stages of mission, including the design considerations that take into account the missions are compatible with sustainable operations and the sustainable on-orbit operations that consider mission objectives, potential harm on the space environment, and the impact on other operators. The SSR is being designed as a composite indicator that includes six distinct modules, the first of which is the Mission Index, developed by the European Space Agency and allows us to have a conceptual idea of the space traffic footprint of the mission to quantify the level of harmful physical interference caused by the planned design and mission operations. I'll pause there and later share the link where you can hear more detail. But as you can see, we're considering different aspects of a space mission, how the operators share data across other operators, how they have ex efforts to avoid collisions among other satellites, how they're following international standards and regulations, and the idea of how easy it is for an independent operator on the ground to detect, identify, and then track these satellites. All of these are features we can measure and have an objective process for evaluating the performance of different missions in these different features. And that creates a very uh, uniformly uh, seen set of discussions people can have across the space industry. So of course, we're in dialogue with those who operate and own satellites, as well as government organizations to see their view on these different standards. Here we'll be addressing. Hello. Our next topic then highlights the uh, need to apply this both at the level of academics, but also through coordination with international bodies. So I've had the pleasure to give uh, presentations as a witness at a congressional hearing, as well as giving presentations in the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs and to the Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, which is one of the major UN bodies addressing international space law. I wanna highlight one more example, uh, showing us ways that we are applying space technology, particularly for those who typically don't have access to use services such as satellite earth observation and other tools to make a change on earth. And I wanna highlight all the students you see here that are active in designing space technology, particularly with satellite data and communication and positioning information as a way to improve and work with colleagues in many countries, including India, Brazil, Ghana, Indonesia. And we're asking how they are working on a particular sustainable development goal, especially number 15, which includes management of forest and biodiversity on land. And we're often asking how local government leaders and companies contribute to this topic. And here all you'll see a bit from our colleague Ufuoma, and she's a graduate student pursuing a doctoral degree in Air Astro with my team. And she's gonna share a bit about her project in Benin and highlighting some of the ways that she's helping local teams address the topic of ecosystem governance. Hello, my name is Ufuoma, and I'll be discussing earth observation to inform community management of invasive plants and traditional fishing practices. The high level introduction to this topic is that coastal ecosystems are extremely important to study um, because a lot of humans live near these coastal ecosystems and interact with them for various um, ecosystem services. Social conflict can arise with these different sets of actors trying to um, use a particular ecosystem for different types of benefits which illustrates the importance of environmental governance, which is a terminology that really just means effective management that considers sustainable 
um, economic, environmental, and social outcomes for a particular community. A tool that can be used for effective environmental governance is earth observation data. And this is because when a decision maker has access to EO data, it can help to um, mitigate social conflict by um, allowing the decision maker to optimize for a particular desired outcome for that community. So I'll illustrate this topic more through a case study of Lake Nokwe in Benin. Benin is a country located in West Africa, and Lake Nokwe is on the southern um, part of Benin. Lake Nokwe is home to around 70,000 people that depend on the lake for a variety of ecosystem services, such as transportation, fishing, and irrigation. These ecosystem th services are threatened by the proliferation of an invasive plant species known as the water hyacinth. The water hyacinth is known for clogging transportation networks and irrigation canals, and um, seasonally it um, absorbs a lot of oxygen, which can kill fish and, um, as a consequence, affect those who depend on fishing for their livelihoods. Another aspect. Hufuma continues the discussion and highlights how we are collaborating with a particular company located in Benin called Greenkeeper Africa. And they have a mission to create jobs in their local lake district by hiring people who live right on the lake to actually gather this water hyacinth plant. The company then uses it as a product that can help absorb oil pollution. Ufoma has been working with this team as well as our collaborators at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And we're developing tools to use data from satellites, from drones, and from water-based sensors to improve our ability and the local team's abilities to monitor the behavior of this plant and also to understand the overall health of the ecosystem. So here you see examples of Ufoma's experience learning to fly a drone, and this will be operated locally uh, by the teams going forward. And we've also been prototyping examples of low cost water sensor kits that can be operated and, and maintained manually locally. Ultimately, we're working with a company that will help create an intuitive online dashboard system so the data from the satellites, from the drones, from water sensors and from other local science measurements can be collected in a place that's useful for both scientists and for people from other fields who are trying to think about this integrated water research management goal. This is really centered to what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a process that creates new information for those who are most interested in it, who live in that community, but also makes it easier to manage and to be a part of. Finally, I'll highlight the way we've recently been adding new aspects to this work due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I mentioned, for example, that we are often working to apply data from satellites with socioeconomic considerations. And our VITA decision support system is one example of this. And I have a brief introduction uh, by our colleague, Jack Reed, who's gonna highlight this, and this will be our last video, and we can go to the Q&A. So I'll pass it over to Jack. Howdy, everyone. This video will provide an introduction to our VITA Decision Support System project. Our team has been working on a modeling framework to both support sustainable development decision making and inform Earth observation system requirement setting. This framework, which we call EVDT, has four components, environment, human vulnerability, and societal impact, or just vulnerability for short, human decision making, and technology design. The idea behind this framework is that many sustainable development contexts can be characterized as complex systems where the environment and humans can't be neatly separated and examined independently. By approaching a situation from this perspective, we hope to both support policymaking and to inform the design of future EO systems. We have been applying this framework to various applications, as can be seen elsewhere. As the coronavirus pandemic swept the globe, however, Many of our local points of contact had a sudden change in priorities, as you might imagine. Several of them raised the possibility of adapting and expanding the EVDT modeling framework to approach coronavirus-related decision-making and impact analysis. This seemed quite reasonable to us, and we responded by forming a multi-institution team with relevant expertise, including public health expert Dr. Muhammad Jalali of Harvard Medical School, earth scientist Dr. David Lago Messino of East Carolina University, and data analytics expert Eric Ashcroft of Blue Raster. The EVDT modeling framework is flexible and allows optional models to be added depending on the application, and the coronavirus pandemic was sufficiently different from our ongoing applications that we elected to add a conceptually distinct public health model 
as seen here. For clarity of communication with all of our collaborators, we also chose to give this version a new name, the VITA Decision Support System. Let's now go through each of these components. In the coming parts of the video, Jack goes on to highlight how we take data about the environment, data from the locally sourced public health summaries of the COVID cases, data about economic changes, and data about public policies, especially for closure at the city level. We've been lately working with colleagues who are directly integrating with the national and regional COVID response, particularly in the countries of Brazil, Chile, Mexico, Angola, and Indonesia. And we're developing a prototype, here you see it in Spanish because we're working particularly with several countries that speak either Spanish or Portuguese, so we are able to change language as needed. But we're developing a prototype information tool that shows both spatial data, such as environmental data, and how it might be changing over time and space, as well as data that can be graphed to see whether there's increases and decreases in COVID cases, but also in socioeconomic indicators, such as employment or the use of public transportation or other forms of mobility. We're also seeing some reporting on uh, socioeconomic changes such as imports and exports and other economic indicators. Our goal is to make it easy for decision makers who are planning the next policies for COVID to consider all at once the environmental factors, socioeconomic factors, and of course the public health factors that are key to the COVID response. Currently we are developing an ongoing dialogue and we'll have our first meeting of the VITA Decision Support System Global Collaboration Network next week, bringing together some of the leaders from each of these countries who have been active in major cities responding to the COVID outbreak. With that, I'd like to pause and open it up for discussion, and I look forward to the dialogue, and I believe we have some prepared questions from our moderator. So thank you so much. Thank you, Di thank you, Professor Wood. That, that was great. Um, I, I did want to ask about your relationship with these um, I'll call them clients at the moment, with the people who want to sponsor some of the, some of the work. Um, how, do, how does it come to you? Why, why is this, uh, how, how do you make it and what measures do you use to see that it's uh, going to be advancing social justice as well here on earth if we're gonna use these tools that, are, that have been developed? Thank you so much for asking. And I try to use the word collaborator if that's really the true description of how I work with different teams. I showed this map at the very end highlighting opportunities that we have. We're working often with either government representatives or with fellow faculty who play a role in advising their own government. I have a couple key principles I try to keep in mind when choosing who to collaborate with and then what, uh, how to behave during a collaboration. The first is that when possible, especially if I'm going to do a project in a place where I don't live, if possible, I try to work only where I'm invited. Now, of course, I, I live here in the Boston, Cambridge area, so I may start projects that kind of are relevant to Boston that are part of my community. But when I work in places like Rio de Janeiro, Santiago de Chile, and we're, we're working currently in Querétaro State in Mexico, in as we showed like Noque and Benin, all of those are places I'm working because someone invited me and was open to collaborating. And in this case, I'm so fortunate that there are amazing innovative people who really inspire me because they're already working on one of the sustainable development goals. So in these examples, I can highlight that before I was involved with these projects and these teams, they already either had adopted the particular SDGs or some very similar framework, and they were already having demonstrable outcomes. For example, in Chile, we're working on this VITA project uh, for COVID-19 with the Ministry of Science. And although it's a new organization, they had made a lot of progress asking how they could design a national space policy to address economic and social needs in the country. And they were also looking at ways to make data more relevant for social applications. So of course we, we shared a common sense of purpose. So I think the first point is that I am invited to work in places and I choose collaborators who inspire me because they are already making great progress in their own environment, their own locations uh, with some effort towards the SDGs. Of course, the third area is I get to know people very well and we stay in close touch. Of course, before COVID, I might've had the chance to visit some of these places in person. I've traveled to Rio and to Santiago, Chile and to parts of Benin and Ghana. And I hoped in the future to visit our collaborators in Indonesia. I've been visiting folks in, in places like uh, Angola. And so of course, uh, normally we spend time uh, really sharing space, sharing meals, which is one way to get to know people and see uh, how they live and, and have a sense of trust for their vision. It's more difficult now uh, during the time of COVID. So we spend a lot more time communicating virtually, but still this time spent together, helps us to build uh, a sense of trust. And I can just say people often would comment, I do a lot of work in 
uh, South America and parts of Central America and the Caribbean, as well as in parts of Africa and Southeast Asia. And there's a common complaint that people might argue, well, you might encounter a lot of corruption when you're working in different countries. And of course that could happen in the United States. And I will just say that I can name so many amazing bureaucrats, people who work for governments and people who work for universities and companies who are, I'm very confident through their demonstrated self-sacrificial work that they are far from corrupt. In fact, they're really losing money, you could say, by serving their country. So I'd say that, of course, I know corruption exists, but I'm so proud to know these leaders who are not only not corrupt, but they're actually sacrificing you know, the well-being of their families to serve their larger community. And that's how I can say I, I trust them so much to work with them. So thank you for asking. That's great. One other question from me. Um, out of these projects, um, are there technologies and things that you had designs from space-enabled designs that, that you're able to bring back on Earth and, and then uh, share with the people that you're working with? What kinds of technology, in other words, is really where I'm, I'm curious about that. I know that we have robots at Mars and we're certainly trying to develop robots here on Earth, but have they been able to to help with different countries, um, environmental management, coastal management, that kind of thing. Thank you so much for asking about the topic of technology transfer. As I noted at the beginning, it's one of my six kind of categories. And I can give a great story just to appreciate where I've come from in the past. When I was still a graduate student at MIT, I had the privilege to work as an intern for one of the offices as part of NASA's technology transfer program. Not everyone may be aware, but many of the US government agencies that develop research and technology they have uh, both a congressional mandate, but also an ongoing commitment to helping to find ways that their inventions in their space technology or other advanced technologies can be redesigned and repurposed for non-government or non-space needs. So there's a great program where NASA, for example, has 10 centers, and they are always asking which of our NASA inventions or innovations could be spin-offs. I hope people who may not know can look out for NASA's publications. There's a great uh, annual publication called Spinoff. You can just Google search Spinoff and NASA, and you'll find uh, every year there's about 50 examples published. And so I had the privilege of learning, even as a student, some of the categories. And what's great is that uh, NASA thinks of its innovation quite broadly. There's hardware developments, as well as software, as well as examples of more like ways of doing things, ways of solving problems. Of course, uh, we can think about NASA technology going into lots of different industries. Sometimes it's, it's a great example where there's a, a need for a topic like improving the efficiency of airplanes. And that's part of NASA's direct mission. So there's uh, ways that sort of NASA invents or, or researches a certain topic and then make sure that companies can use that kind of uh, finding. Uh, another example might be materials that NASA develops uh, that are particularly efficient or even helps people protect for safety. So for kind of extreme environments, uh, NASA often gives us materials that we need. There's examples of materials that are good for keeping you safe if you're cold in a sort of external place uh, during a disaster. Uh, there's examples of even the materials that are used in bulletproof vests. These are all kinds of things that were explored of as, as part of development for space technology. What's great is to think about the lifestyle on the International Space Station. If you're on the ISS, you're in a place with limited power and limited access to air and water and food. So all the innovations that go into making life possible on the ISS relate to other places where there might be limited access to these key life-giving resources. So the work that NASA is doing to study food, including the ability to keep food healthy longer. So examples of uh, keeping produce sort of healthy over a long shelf life, which is part of what you can do it by reducing exposure to the chemicals in the air that cause it to, to go bad. Or asking the question, how do we improve farming in a very efficient way, for example, in space? Those are actually spin-offs that also can be used on Earth. Similarly with water filtration, uh, a maybe more well-known story is the idea that, well, astronauts, they have to recycle water. Their wastewater includes their own uh, personal waste as well as dirty water they might have as part of cooking. And all of that uh, can be reused. And the filtration systems on the ISS are very high quality and could be used in other Earth-based filtration systems. So the great news is there, there are full-time employees working within NASA and other national agencies, for example, in Europe and Japan. And they have the job to look for examples where they can find people outside the space industry, take these innovation in uh, food and water management, air purification, as well as in medical technologies and material science. They want to try to move all of it out into society. That's great. Thank you. Uh, a couple questions from the Q&A um, uh, list that we have here. Uh, Bob Chen was saying, hi, Danielle, can you say more about what programs and majors your students come from and how you recruit them and get them to work together on interdisciplinary programs? Big shout out to Bob, it's great to have you. He's often somebody who's inspiring me and pointing me to the resources I need. So thank you, Bob, for being on today. But yes, it's a great question to ask. 
what kinds of uh, backgrounds the students come from, especially because, well, on my side, I kind of took a, a route to try to get you know, a variety of, of areas of training. And I hope that in the future, the graduates from our programs, those who are interested in it, are willing to cross train in several fields. So for myself, uh, I studied engineering on the aerospace side and then system engineering and also policy, but included in my PhD work included a lot of mentorship under a social scientist. I'll give the example of Professor Alice Amsden, who unfortunately has passed away, but yeah. she was in urban studies and planning and she was a really important mentor for me, thinking about the idea of how countries that were new to a certain field adopt that knowledge. And I studied this for the topic of space. So currently I'm so fortunate as in my team in the media lab, I'm able to include students with aerospace engineering backgrounds, practicing artists and graphic designers or industrial designers, people with architecture backgrounds, people who are interested in working uh, in more sort of concrete computer science and uh, artificial intelligence areas. Uh, so we try to be welcoming of different backgrounds, but I will say it's challenging. We have to work hard to learn to communicate across different areas. And I do recommend that those who study uh, science and engineering as their core area, for example, at undergrad level, also look for ways to get some additional training, whether it's through language, I, I just minored in Spanish, or perhaps gaining a, an additional skill like policy or business. I'm just so convinced that the future challenges we'll face are gonna require you know, these, this combination of skills that go across so some of the physical knowledge, physical science, uh, as well as social science and uh, areas like policy and language. Thank you, Bob, for the question. I, I, um, there is another question at the beginning that came up. Uh, it says, uh, it's Lee Dakola. Some people view space exploration as a potential escape from an unsustainable ruling earth, which is an interesting question. And I, and I it made me think also of the, uh, the flip side of that, which is how do we not turn space exploration into a new colonial uh, disaster experience? Ramon, I'm so glad you asked that question. Uh, this year, MIT for the first time, thanks to a lot of agitation by students, uh, MIT changed the name of our official, uh, our official academic calendar of the second Monday in October, the holiday, uh, from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. And this is done quite very much on purpose to ask the question, how can we begin to adopt uh, a mindset that acknowledges uh, the harm of the colonial mindset in, in the history of our country, including in our own land? But also, how can we think about the future with anti-colonial views? Uh, to celebrate this, I wrote a blog piece, and I'm happy to share that with the, the colleagues online. It basically asked this question, how do we adopt an anti-colonial mindset for space activity? And I'm not alone in this. I want to give credit to a few other people who are inspiring me. One example is current uh, doctoral student in Air Astro, uh, Alvin Harvey, who's from the Navajo Nation. And I was fortunate to have him as a student in my class, a class where we are exploring these questions in greater depth, reading from social science and history, and trying to write about recommendations to engineers and scientists. And Alvin has been writing a description and doing interviews and studies to ask, what would be the perspective from his particular community, the Navajo Nation, uh, on the topic of how humans should act in space? What kind of guidelines or ideas would they want to add to that global dialogue? I also have in my team a student named Prathima Muniapa, who has a background in architecture and cultural conservation. She did her master's, first master's, at Harvard's Graduate School of Design, a second master's with me, and is now doing a PhD. And she has a long history in asking, how do we both give respect to, but also uh, learn from, the knowledge of both the, the earth environment, but also uh, the cosmos from indigenous communities in, in places around the world. She particularly is uh, working with teams based in India where, who live in forest areas. But what's exciting is that we can look around at traditional communities around the world and so many of them do have a cosmology. They have some sense of what happens in space as part of their long-term ancient knowledge. And they also have some relationship to locations in space. For example, many groups consider the moon a sacred place. So it leads me to think that if we listened more carefully to these communities, we would realize that even if there's not people living on the moon right now, there's still a sense of sacredness we should respect. Meaning we don't necessarily just think it's fine to sort of make a mess somewhere else like on the moon to keep earth cleaner. We should rather than be more innovative and find ways to be sustainable wherever humans have activity, whether it's on earth, in orbit around the earth, on the moon. So of course, I'm excited about the technology that we were inventing. I remember as an undergrad, my, my senior year project was asking, can we invent a system that could then convert uh, soil from the moon called regolith and, can, and actually extract oxygen for the use of humans as a technology ex experiment you know, research project. And I now wanna ask the question, if we are going to do that, what kind of guidelines should we put in place on how we use materials from the moon? I'm excited that right now in my class, one of the students who has an architecture background is asking the question, uh, what does it mean to make monuments and places off earth? Meaning if you're talking about the experience of the astronauts you know, operating on the moon, 
uh, which parts become a museum piece and what does it mean in a cultural sense as well as a sort of technical sense to make something a monument sort of in a different place. And I, I just wanna argue that we have not thought enough about this and that we should consider just like we do with um, parks on earth, we kind of set aside certain areas for the enjoyment and for the long-term aesthetic pleasure of humans and also because they are interesting ge geological places. I think we should have a similar discussion about that on other places like the moon on Mars, but we should also then ask what are the perspective of communities especially indigenous communities that also have a, a certain way of describing kind of shared property that's different from sort of the Western capitalist view. So I think this is a really important topic. And actually what, what's happening now is that companies may be driving our activities in places like the moon. They may be the ones, of course, with government oversight, but they may be the ones who sort of set the, the pattern of how we behave. And I hope that instead we can have a more uh, pluralistic discussion that includes both uh, commercial and public and you know, non-commercial organizations all considering these topics. That's great. Yes. We had a couple of questions uh, specific to the projects that you suggested and, and showed us. Uh, one is from someone named C. Is the beeswax synthetic or natural in these experiments? Is there a de scalable development pathway that makes this look sustainable for large rockets and in large quantities? Or would it primarily have applications in nano sat satellites? Oops, did you freeze, Danielle? Uh, all right, well, that's one question. We'll see if <laughs> um, Danielle, you're frozen. Okay, let's see. Um, so that was a specific, we're gonna have to wait till she comes back on that. There's another question here about um, uh, da, 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 da. how, how um, whether the sustainability index um, accounts for the harm satellite constellations may do to the practice of astronomy. Um, it it kind of goes along with a, um, a question also from Jillian. How do you see pr proliferation of satellite communications ha helping with justice? Actually, that goes a little beyond. So there she's back. Let me, let me read you again the first one. They were specific to the projects you showed us. Um, and uh, where is it? It was a question about the beeswax, uh, whether it is, is synthetic or natural and whether there's a scalable developmental pathway that makes it look sustainable for ro large rockets in large quantities or does it have to be applications in nanosatellites? All right, thank you. I think I have a good sense of the conversation so I'll just jump right in. Uh, a couple of different points. So uh, let's take the wax first. Uh, the first angle to say is there's been lots of study over the last about 30 years on the topic of using candle wax, which is mainly a combination of carbon and hydrogen as a fuel for rockets to, to launch from the ground to space. And I'll give credit to a particular team at Stanford University. Uh, they've really done the pioneering work on this topic and then many others around the world have also added to it. So there's a lot of literature on this topic. And so that's kind of a known topic and it's, it's really on the, the gravity based version, meaning it's the under earth gravity uh, for the launch. And there's, uh, it's not quite been demonstrated, but it's, it's almost the point of being mature and sort of a known technology. There's some technology questions around uh, how to keep the right uh, structural properties of the wax. And interestingly, they're gonna draw particularly from the supply chain that actually is linked to the broader supply chain for oil refinement. So there's actually a lot of plentiful candle wax available. Uh, so paraffin, and it's available in sort of commercial settings. So that's actually not a concern, but it is a question of, do we wanna support a, an oil-based uh, industry. So that's one category. It's available, it's, it's affordable, but it's also linked to oil. So the other question we have as Space Enabled is two sides. One is we're exploring uh, different kinds of beeswax, which is natural beeswax. We're very thankful that we've had a relationship with a local beekeeping team, uh, an urban beekeeping team called Best Bees in the Boston area. And they are a team open to research as, as part of their activities. And they've been donating wax to us on very small scale. For, for now, we, we only need small amounts. But we are noticing that uh, we're proposing a, a approach that wouldn't necessarily recommend, I mean, I'm not recommending or studying the idea of using it for rocket launches from Earth, although it's not impossible, but I'm really particularly interested in the space side. So we're proposing a, a medium a, a amount that would be needed for satellites. And we're also exploring further the geographic differences of wax from different countries. So thanks to our international collaboration, we hope to eventually be sampling waxes from different places and understanding their chemical properties. And of course, their sort of ingredients based on different flowers and bee types. So eventually we'd like to comment on whether there's any difference or maybe they're all quite similar in the behavior of different waxes. So after a couple more years, we can comment on that. But the idea here is we, we are excited that actually 
in, in the, the general principle that space should be accessible, wouldn't it be interesting if, if teams that need a small amount of wax could source it locally from local bees? And if we understood exactly whether that was feasible, that would be exciting for us. I can also- Bees in space. I'm sorry, go ahead. Bees in but, space, I love it. That's right. There, there certainly is this in a separate sort of line of research on uh, the actual behavior of bees and people have demonstrated that bees can adapt to operating microgravity. So in theory, there's this possibility, although I, I don't know if the bees prefer or not to be in microgravity, but there has, it's been demonstrated that they can sort of function and create hives and, and um, wax in space as well. The other angle talked about this uh, trade-off, right? So one question was, uh, what are the concerns with large constellations and their impacts on astronomy? And it is a real concern. And of course, part of me is, is supporting basic research in space, including astrophysics and astronomy research. And part of me is saying we should also be able to track satellites so we can have safety of knowing where they are. And these are a little bit in tension, but actually the good news is we've been doing a lot of analysis and I wanna give credit to a colleague, Professor Murray Baja at UT Austin, University of Texas, Texas at Austin. He's a close collaborator on this topic of the space sustainability rating. And we've been exchanging with him, but also uh, getting input also from people in the astronomy community. A couple of points to consider. One is that a satellite does not have to be very bright to be observed by a system designed for tracking satellites. There's a concept called visual magnitude, which describes the apparent brightness of an object in space. And we could say there's a number uh, of different ranges where a smaller number is brighter. And so you could have something as faint as what we call 15th visual magnitude and see it well with a, a telescope on the average of uh, maybe a five, uh, 0.5 meter diameter, which means it's a relatively small size. It's not very expensive. And this is kind of what we're calling the middle of the road observer system. So our team's been doing simulations of different orbital sy systems and sort of estimating with this kind of moderately priced uh, system to track satellites with the optical telescope, uh, would you be able to see different uh, brightnesses of satellites? So we're saying that there's a reasonable level of brightness for satellite tracking for safety. And that's uh, so much darker than what we're, what we're noticing. So these new commercial satellites that are being very bright in the sky, they're more likely to be much brighter, more like, um, you know, say six or seven or six or three or four, these brightnesses that you can see with the naked eye when standing on the ground. So we're basically saying aim to be bright enough to be tracked, but don't aim to be bright enough to be seen by observers who are trying to avoid you or trying to have a dark sky. So I think there probably are uh, levels of brightness that are kind of healthy, both for, for keeping safe while tracking satellites, but also for uh, avoiding major disruptions. But also another uh, tool that can be used is to basically have astronomers work with satellite trackers more and plan because they don't necessarily need to know, um, be sort of dark all the time, but there's certain parts of the orbit uh, where a satellite can, can sort of block an astronomer. So there's uh, teams who are, again, doing simulations and calculations to figure out, can you basically have better coordination between satellite trackers and astronomers to also help avoid some of that challenge. But it's something that can be handled. It's a matter of better communication between these communities. So we're working on that. That's great. Um, YJ Kim asked, what type of projects would you ideally like to work on 10 years from now? Oh, that's a lovely question, especially because in 10 years, I hope to have tenure, which would be you know, a whole new world. So I'm in my third year at Space Enabled right now. So I'll highlight, of course, I, I gave you these three big themes, right? One idea is, uh, we're working on making space accessible and sustainable. We're working on uh, tools that make space technology address sustainable development goals on Earth. And we're also working on a broader topic I didn't discuss as much, which is the idea of using systems thinking and engineering design principles to ask how we can reduce harm to different racial groups or other identity groups. And so we have a, a team led by Dr. Caitlin Turner. And in that part of the work, we're developing uh, methodologies within the engineering design process to have clear sort of gu guidelines of when to ask, how are there possible inputs to this technology or operational aspects or outputs to the technology that potentially cause harm to different racial groups? We recently offered a class to member organizations of the Media Lab, a four day discussion on this idea of applying anti-racism within technology design. So to be honest, the projects that I've chosen, I think are gonna last for a long time, meaning I would love to you know, sort of say we're gonna conquer racism in 10 years, but I think we probably won't. So I think I'll probably be working in some sense on these broader topics for decades to come. And I think that's okay. I mean, I, I understand that I'm trying to take on challenges that were hundreds of years in the making. And I think it'll be you know, decades to, to address, but I do hope to have you know, sort of milestones, for example, whereas right now we're developing the early theory on some of these concepts. I hope that in 10 years, that theory is in place. We've really refined it and uh, kind of brought to a mature place. And then we'll be able to really be working with partners like companies and organizations and governments and we'll be implementing sort of innovative new ways of using this theory. So I hope that in 10 years, I've sort of laid out a foundation that you know, I'm proud of as a you know, bunch of papers that kind of lay out, here's how to do things. And I'll be continuing to do some of the same work on applying space for development on earth, helping to guide 
space activity that's also sustainable in space and also trying to be equitable in our technology, but all of it will be much more uh, firm. And then we can really have more impact and, and scale some of the things even broader. That's great. I, Good. Sarah, Go here, I, I see a couple of questions that are kind of related. Maybe they can be answered together. Um, they are, one is from Bettina Arkhurst says, thank you for the great presentation and discussion. It seems as though Dr. Wood is able to effectively engage with the diverse array of communities. Aside from instances in which a community leader reaches out to your group, how do you go about forming these community collaborations? And the, the, what I think was somewhat related, resonant uh, question from Samuel Nixon Jr. says, how do you and your team go about engaging the local residents in your work in ways that they are able to interpret the purpose and approach present it in ways that the community embraces and supports uh, with full realization of the potential impact it can have on their environment. Do you have a, do you have to be creative sometimes to get communities on board and, and clear about the approaches you're using? Thank you and greetings to, to all the folks and the, our friends and colleagues, great to hear from you. So thanks for the question. And of course, uh, this is an ongoing process of trying to um, be careful and then learn from mistakes sometimes. But I'll give a couple of examples. The first question asked, how do I kind of build relationships? And I'll say it's, it's from uh, multiple years of practice. I was very fortunate as a student at MIT, one of the things I wanna, I guess, credit MIT with is it gave me a chance to practice being a leader early on. So during my doctoral studies, I was able to get a lot of advice and, and to fundraise to gain fellowships. I have to give credit to the US government which funded my graduate degrees through funding from NASA, from the Air Force and from the National Science Foundation. And after I was able to uh, earn these fellowships, I had some intellectual independence. I wanted to ask the question, uh, how are countries in Africa and parts of the Middle East and Southeast Asia, how are they adopting and starting new satellite-based research projects or operational projects? And I was able to, as part of that, uh, answering that question, uh, do a lot of international field work. So even as a doctoral student, I traveled to about 15 countries uh, with funding that I raised to different uh, scholarships and fellowships. And I did interviews with leaders in several countries in Africa, like South Africa and Nigeria, Kenya, later I went to Ghana, I was able to visit Turkey and the UAE, as well as Malaysia and Singapore and Thailand and Korea. <laughs> but these countries also had collaborators in places like Europe. So I also visited the UK and Germany. And the result of this is that I'm also, of course, part of a larger community of organizations. Some of you are also representing these groups. I'll mention, for example, the group on Earth Observation, an international network of, of governments and non-government teams considering this topic of using satellite data for development, as well as I'll, I'll give credit to the international Astronomical Federation that I represent MIT in that network of organizations interested in space. So the, the short answer is that I spend a lot of time with people, you know, through these networks, and that is often how I have a chance to build relationships, which lead to projects and collaborations. And then, to be honest, uh, at any given time, there's probably more good ideas than there are, you know, actual opportunities or funding. So for now, I'd say like we have great projects going, and we probably can't start too many more until we finish some of these, you know, for now. But often the ideas are more plentiful than the actual opportunities and funding, but I'm so grateful for students uh, who also can um, kind of volunteer right, as part of the thesis work to work on these activities. And then thinking about locally, right now I'm also doing some work in several US cities. We're studying innovation practices as part of our anti-racism work in both Boston and Detroit. And again, I appreciate uh, the, uh, Samuel Dixon's question asking the idea of what does it mean to interact with communities? And, and one question would be, am I trying to sell them on my project? And hopefully not, but instead we try to get a guidance from, on how to behave from local leaders. For example, I've noticed in the United States, if I wanna do a project that asks, how are their efforts to spur urban entrepreneurs in the cities of Detroit and Cleveland? I shouldn't just show up and say, hello, I'm from MIT, talk to me, I'm here to help. <laughs> that usually wouldn't be good, but I, I found that local leaders who are already doing related work, for example, uh, often foundations that often fund innovation, for example, or fund studies on innovation, they're the ones who have been discussing a certain region and, and kind of know the regional needs. So I've been finding it's important to go to le local leaders who already have status and who already have an idea that the community believes in and then just go with whatever they're already doing. If they think they need to improve innovation, I agree with them and we'll go with together, but I shouldn't um, sort of decide for myself what the value should be. That is great. We have, we have just about arrived at three. Uh, I do wanna say that uh, the Alumni Association does leave open the faculty forum for a few minutes after if people still want to uh, do questions and ask. Um, I um, do wanna say that um, 
on behalf of the Alumni Association, thank you for tuning in to this webinar on designing for sustainability in Earth and on space in an equitable manner. Our thanks to the Alumni Association staff, Moana Benton, Joe Gonigal, and Paige Morgan for supporting this event. Many thanks to Professor Wood for joining us today. We will share all the questions with the Space Enabled Research Group, uh, and that's perhaps the best place to ask questions and to connect. There was a question about how we alumni can help. So if people do want to stay on and talk a little bit about that, and if Danielle, you you were running off to another to another conference, I know. Uh, the broadcast is going to be available on the MIT Alumni Association YouTube channel, and it will have closed captioning within a week of today's airing. Um, we encourage alumni to learn more about the MIT Energy Environment and S S Sustainability Network. And I just put the uh, URL in the in the um, a question in in the chat from from the panelists. Um, the um, Danielle, you have have mentioned that that your slides didn't feel particularly helpful to people, so there we probably won't be distributing those. But if you would write to us with some of the references that you that you mentioned, we can distribute those to the people who who uh, came to this webinar. Yeah, there was uh, a question earlier about that at the beginning from Ron Spangler. Representation, whatever, would the materials be available uh, with links or something? So, uh, so we will get links and we'll get them back out to you. And I, as on behalf of uh, the faculty forum and the uh, EESN, we'd like you to keep an eye out open for our monthly webinars and other activities. Write to us um, by finding our address on on our uh, main web page. But great, Danielle. Oh, I meant to say that MIT has just opened a a um, a challenge for climate issues. And today, this afternoon, starting very soon, there's a uh, seminar about how um, how MIT should strengthen its response to the climate issues. Um, so, if you folks um, just look on the grand grand challenge. Um, if you go to the MIT website, go to the Climate Grant Challenges, or look on the EESN website for connections to those, um, you can hear um, Professor Wood and a couple of other people talk about their two-page ideas that they they are uh, vying with a, a lot of other people around, principal investigators around MIT, to to see what kind of a a major program can help us really move the needle on on climate issues. So I want to thank you all again. Um, and let's see is, if there are more questions and answers here. Uh, Daniel, Professor Wood, I, I, you, I think you're going to have to, do you have to go immediately or or how are, how are you fixed here? Thank you so much. I should sign off and get ready for the next presentation, but I'm very glad that you offered to organize some of the questions and I'm happy to follow up and sort of provide re relevant references to help out afterwards. So thank you for that. Very thank good. You. All right, goodbye, Professor Wood. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.